And as we mentioned earlier, the crisis across America's campuses is making some wrestle with the current definition of anti-Semitism, as written by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. It's a definition which has been adopted by countries across the globe. Next, Michelle Martin speaks to the author Kenneth Stern, who led the drafting of that document and who now warns it's being used to chill free speech. Thanks, Christiane. Kenneth Stern, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I just want to mention that you have a distinguished career as a trial lawyer, as an author, as a human rights activist. But what I think a lot of people might know about you is that you were the lead drafter of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. And we're going to talk a little bit about the way you feel this definition has been used and perhaps misused. But I just wanted to ask you to start us off by telling us why you drafted this to begin with. What was the, what's, what's the origin story of this? Well, the origin story was that after the beginning of the Second Intifada and the collapse of the peace process in 2000, there was an uptick in attacks on Jews in, particularly in Europe, in the United States too, but mostly in Europe. And there was a group called the European Monitoring Center that was tasked with doing reports about racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism, and it put out a report in the end of 2004 that found, in fact, that the, some of the attacks were by not only the traditional suspects, white supremacists and others, but also by young Arab and Muslim folks in some outskirts of Paris and other places like that. So the data was right, but they said, we have a problem in that we have all these different countries that have people that are collecting information and no common score sheet, no common definition of what to look at. And then they also said, well, we're going to have a temporary definition that's going to look at issues of anti-Semitism based on stereotypes about Jews. And they went through that exercise and said, what do we do if a Jew is attacked on the streets of a European city as a stand-in for an Israeli? And they said, if somebody had these stereotypes and applied them to Israelis and then reapplied them to Jews, that was, that was anti-Semitism, but not if they were upset with Israeli policy. They said that's lamentable, but should not be counted. And that struck me as, as nuts, basically, because I grew up at the time of the civil rights movement. And I can't imagine somebody saying, well, lynching some black person is racist if they have these stereotypes about black people, but not if they were upset by a political event, uh, Martin Luther King speech. So it just so happened that the director of the European Monitoring Center was invited by a colleague to come to the American Jewish Committee, where I worked, for its annual meeting to talk broadly with others about what was happening in Europe. And as we saw then, and as we see now, there's some discourse about Israel that's correlated with attacks on Jews, not necessarily causation, but we thought it was important to take the temperature. Um, there were other reasons for the definition too, but that's how it started. And that's why there are Israel examples inside the definition. I wanted to talk about the op-ed you wrote for the Boston Globe a few weeks ago. You say that the term is now being used it's now being weaponized, actually, to muzzle free speech on campus. Could you just explain how the term or the framework that you wrote is now being weaponized and why you find that dangerous? Well, the, the language of the, the definition was being started to be used in Title VI cases after 2010. And it was looking at um, issues like what a professor was teaching, um, what speakers were coming into campus, uh, what texts were being assigned, um, things that clearly are the heart of academic freedom. And, you know, my concern is that the pushing of this on, especially on Title VI cases, I'm not, not particularly worried about the, the, the cases themselves, although I am worried about how some of them are going to be litigated. The pressure is on administrators when they know that people are poised to sue um, when uh, certain speech is ha happening on a campus that may trigger somebody to file a Title VI case, they're more likely to try to suppress that speech or counter that speech because part of what they do in their day job is to protect the university from being sued. So I see it as not only just a question of the legal question, I see it as intentionally trying to create a, a chilling effect. And I don't think that's appropriate. You counter speech. With other speech, you don't use instruments of law to suppress speech, and that's how I see this being used. And it's also becoming a symbol. 
in a way that's really troubling to me too about you know being concerned about anti-Semitism, which is the you know work I've been doing for decades. Once we try to reduce things into um, is this anti-Semitism or not, we're losing focus on so many things about how anti-Semitism works in the real world. We'd all consider the Tree of Life shooting clearly anti-Semitic, but the shooter at the Walmart in El Paso a few months later had the same ideology. He was worried about the fevered pitch about immigrants destroying our country. We look at one as anti-Semitism. We don't look at the other as anti-Semitism. When I, when I talk to synagogues and I say, we're just concerned about anti-Semitism, um, what concerns me most is not necessarily what people are saying about Jews. It's what politicians and others are saying about anyone among us as a danger, the, whether it's immigrants or Muslims or others, because once you prime that pump, that inevitably leads to people getting into these buckets of thinking um, that are, are sort of conveyor belts to conspiracy theories. On top of that, I you know worked at the American Jewish Committee for 25 years. I jealously guarded the term anti-Semitism. To have a sting, it has to be used only in the clearest cases. So I'd always default to not. Now there's a push to make it almost ubiquitous. And when everything becomes anti-Semitic, nothing is anti-Semitic. And that makes it harder to fight anti-Semitism. You know, look, I take your point. Look, if everything's anti-Semitism, then nothing is anti-Semitism. But having said that, does the framework still have utility? Like, is there is there still a, a need for this or is that or has it gone so far then in its misuse that it no longer has utility? Well, I think, you know, there are various definitions of anti-Semitism. Some of them are better for one purpose or another. Some of them are more likely to be used to stop pro-Palestinian speech or at least abused, which is how I see the, you know, the IRA definition uh, being engaged. But, you know, all of them have as a core the basic idea that anti-Semitism is conspiracy theory uh, about Jews harming humanity um, and, you know, giving an explanation for what goes wrong in the world. But again, I don't want the shortcuts to be used to look at speech. And the, the parallel I, I look at is imagine if one had put together a definition of racism that would also take into account some political things that may affect racism. Not to say if you say these things are inherently racist, but they may be appropriate things to consider. So opposition to Black Lives Matter, opposition uh, to removal of Confederate statues, opposition to affirmative action, then you can make the argument that those things might be indicias of, of the temperature of racism to put into uh, surveys and so forth. Would you want to then have a, a hate speech code in effect, let alone uh, endorsed by Congress that says if one has this particular view on any of these issues, they're therefore expressing racism? I don't think so. And you'd see the, the damage that that would do to the ability to even look at these things on a college campus. And those are the same concerns I have about the use of these definitions um, in this context. This is kind of exactly the issue that we see at play now as these demonstrations on college campuses have have you know spread r really across the country and I, I just you know this is sort of the argument that we are being told that this is between you know an, an argument between free speech and student safety do you see it that way admittedly a complicated issue but I see the you know students should be safe from harassment from intimidation from bullying from discrimination regardless of whether they fit into one of the, you know, the classifications legally, any student should be protected from those things. But students should be prepared and the university should stress that students are gonna hear things that they find disturbing. I hear a lot of the, the chants and things disturbing, um, but if they're not being made as part of a threat, just a, a question of expression, that has to be protected. Part of the background to what we're seeing now was the push to outlaw uh, students for justice in Palestine because of what they're saying. And I disagree with a lot of what they're saying, but I don't want them banned. DeSantis did that in Florida, Brandeis did that, not based on anything they did, just in terms of what they were saying. And so that's part of the reason why I think we're seeing some of the uptick now in the response is that there's been a, you know, a lack of clarity. We're not, you know, we're gonna support your right to say things that we find you know, offensive. We're going to use the assets of the institution to teach about it, but we're not going to uh, suspend you or discipline you for things that you say. 
what is the line? Because obviously some speech is already criminal conduct. If a person say, threatens to kill you, right, you can make a credible threat to kill somebody. You can, you can be arrested for that. That's already a crime. So where do you feel like the universities have kind of gone off the rails? Yeah, I mean, if somebody makes a specific threat to a, a person, I'm going to kill you, uh, and it's a direct, immediate threat, that's obviously a problem. There was a case a number of years ago where in California, somebody found the names of everybody that sounded like an Asian uh, student, Asian American student, and put out an email to all of them saying, I'm going to make it my mission in life to hunt you down and kill you or something. Uh, he got convicted appropriately so. But if I just stand up and say something deplorable about about you know Zionist or Israelis or any group um, that's nothing more than speech, that should be countered, but it shouldn't be disciplined, and that's what that's what we're losing. One of the sort of the key flashpoints I think would be around from the river to the sea, right? Palestine should be free from the river to the sea, right? Some people are interpreting that as a as a belief that Israel shouldn't exist. Now, under the definition, you know, one of the, one of the definitions of anti-Semitism under the framework was denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, right? That is one of sort of the definitions. But people who want to use that phrase, some of them say that's not what they're saying. What they're saying is that they, they believe that Israel should be a multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy like the United States. That was kind of a hinge upon which that, the, that congressional hearing where some of the you know, congressional Republicans were hammering on the presidents of a number of the universities and saying that they were insufficiently zealous about guarding against anti-Semitism and genocide. How do you think about that? Well, first of all, the that December 5th hearing was really a setup in a lot of ways. And I found it very offensive that, you know, you have members of Congress who wouldn't criticize President Trump for uh, hosting a, a Holocaust in Ireland, wouldn't criticize him for criticize him for saying immigrants are poisoning the blood of the country, now apparently care about issues like, like anti-Semitism. Um, and what they set up was this... Um, you know, claim that from the river to the sea means genocide against Jews. And are you going to stop claims for genocide against Jews? Again, speech is deplorable. You don't discipline people for it. You use the assets of the university, you know, to go against it. And, you know, there was a poll that came out that, um, what was it, 66% of Jewish students here from the river to the sea as genocide against Jews. And I, I find that 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 phrase disturbing too. I'm a Zionist. I believe in the two state solution, and I think some are using it to say that you know precisely that there's there should be no right uh, of Jews to exist in that area. However, 14 percent of Muslims, only 14 percent of Muslim students surveyed, see that as a, a call for getting rid of Jews or, or genocide. Um, and I think that you know that's that's part of the 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 challenge is that people are hearing different things at the moment. Um, and I have a colleague at Bard who was realizing that people were throwing around terms like anti-Semitism, genocide, ethnic cleansing, settler colonialism as weapons. And we're in a college. So she's putting put together a class. I'm actually teaching the session on anti-Semitism later this week. What do these words mean? How do we understand them? Why do people hear them differently? You know, those are the things that a university should do. It shouldn't say, here's a here's a, a, a statement that's going to get you into discipline for saying as long as it's not a true threat. Muslim students, Muslim people in general, have had this complaint for some time about words that are important in their culture and traditions that they feel have been misused, like jihad. You know, jihad, for example, for, you know, you'll have people say, well, jihad can mean like a jihad against bad habits. You know, we're going to wage a, you know, war against bad habits of our own. And they feel like, well, why do other people get to define what we think without asking us what we mean by those words? So how do you redefine words that have been claimed for certain meanings. Well, and, and it's not new. I mean, and it's not only about yeah. this issue, we see it around politics, immigration, abortion, other things too. You know, I run a hate studies center and that informs a lot of how I think about these issues. 
Um, I think especially on hot button issues where your identity is tethered to an issue of perceived social justice or injustice, we know from brain science and social psychology and other fields that you know, uh, inform hate studies, what happens to human beings? We get into these sort of us versus them buckets. We get into the place where we crave simplicity, we crave certainty, we crave symbols. And I think part of what we're seeing around the, the question of the IRA definition and other things are questions of, of symbols. And we don't want to engage in the complexity of why these things are so contentious. We want somebody to tell us what side of a ledger we should put it on. Uh, and not, and that's, that's part of the concern I have uh, about the push of the the IRA uh, definition. And, and there are a couple of bills in front of Congress at the moment that are considering using it more for educational purposes or also for funding uh, issues and, and in Europe too. And I don't see that as, as different from what I object to with, again, Governor DeSantis, not to pick on him, but what, what he's doing in Florida about what do we teach about gender? What do we teach about race? I may not agree with everything that's being taught, but I don't want the state to define what's okay to teach and what isn't. I want faculty and students and uh, you know universities to do that. And anti-Semitism is a real problem. And there are Jewish students who are being intimidated. But the way to deal with it is not to use law to try to suppress speech we don't like. It's to encourage students how to treat each other, how to realize that, that we're all in the same community together. It's not a competition, you know, between faculty and students. How do we how do we engage this moment together? And why don't we have the intellectual curiosity? Aren't you curious as to why they have that view? Can you have the emotional empathy to imagine yourself in the, their their shoes? So those are the types of things that I think we need to focus on as opposed to just what words should be, you know, ones that get you into trouble. As we are speaking now, um it's the end of the semester. Gr graduations are afoot. In some places, students are being arrested. They're saying they're giving them specific, you know, instructions. If you don't leave by X time, we're going to you're going to be arrested. That's already happened in a number of places. So, if you were advising university presidents who are addressing this, given everything that's already happened, what would you do now? It's a tough qu question. I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm not in their seats, but what I have been telling them when I have been meeting with boards and presidents and so forth is that they should prioritize academic freedom in terms of whatever they, they do. And some of the reasons that we're seeing at the moment was not prioritizing academic freedom. I think that, that you know, arresting students should be the last resort for any reason. Uh, I thought uh, I saw a statement this morning from the president of Wesleyan who basically said, as long as there's not violence, um, we're going to let the encampment be. I understand the dynamics and difficulties with graduations and uh, other things when people can't use that space. It's not an easy thing, um, but it's not going to be resolved by, um, you know, mass arrests or mass suspensions. Uh, and I think that only energizes the protesters in some way, too. And I understand that. Kenneth Stern, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's been my honor uh, to be with you. I thank you very much.